Well, good morning, everybody. I appreciate you joining us for Sunday School again. We're going to continue kind of where we left off last week. We were, we were talking about what it is to be free. Uh, we have freedom in Christ, uh, which was building upon uh, the fruit of the Spirit. So once we know the Lord, we've committed to the Lord, we have the fruit of the Spirit, His Spirit inside us, and we get to live in freedom. And the purpose of that freedom is to serve others and to point others to Christ because we are called to go and make disciples. So today's lesson is what is this about servant leadership? It is a very kind of a buzzword. Uh, a lot of people use it. And so I want to talk about it this morning. Is it even possible to be a servant leader? If I'm one, am I really the other? If I'm, if am I being a servant kind of in a fake way because I really want to be a leader? Um, are these things mutually exclusive, meaning they can't happen together? Uh, so we're going to talk about that in the light of scripture. For those that know me know that one of the things I absolutely love doing in life is coaching. Um, I've had an opportunity to coach over the course of my life, and, I, and it's just so much fun to watch people who they, they dig deep, they work hard, they thrive, and they have success. It's very rewarding. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I think one of the best ways to coach is to coach from this position, uh, that, that you're showing how to do something, but also encouraging somebody to maybe step out beyond what they may be comfortable with. And being a servant leader is not typical for society. So let's look at what Jesus had to, had to say, what, some, some characteristics about him. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then he goes further in John 13, 8, If I do not wash you, you have no share in me. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And if you know John 13, 8, you know he's talking to Peter. Peter was like, you're not going to wash my feet. And we know that after Christ says this, Peter was like, well, then don't just do my feet. Because, you know, we know Peter. If you know the Bible, Peter uh, had that, that personality. So, you know, it, it wasn't enough for him to do the feet once Christ said this to him. But Christ set the example that even he left the throne of God to be served, to be a servant, to serve other people. And there's nothing greater than to serve people. Uh, that is, when you do that in the name of the Lord, when you give a cup of cold water in the name of Christ, I encourage you this week, find somebody you can serve. And when you do it, be sure you say, I do this in the name of Christ. Because sometimes we forget to do that because we actually like the praise that we get for, for taking care of somebody. Uh, but I hope you that you'll take this lesson as an opportunity to say, no, 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 no. I'm doing this because my Savior, my Christ compels me. And it's in his name that I do this. You'll be rewarded for it. So what are some characteristics of a leader? These are word bubbles that you can find on the internet, and it has all sorts of words. Charismatic, confident, intelligent, inspirational, has vision, passion, influential, has, you know, all of these things, right? So we sign up for so many different leadership books and characteristics and things because we're seeking after. I'm going to show you something here in a second that may shock you, but the Bible talks about being a leader is to humble yourself before the Lord and let him exalt you. Humble yourself. So one of the words that is not contained anywhere on any of those pictures is the word humility. Isn't that interesting? Because if I made a question to you and we were together and asked the question, what is the characteristic of a leader? Most of the time, somebody will say something to the effect of, well, they're humble. But that doesn't show up on anybody's lists when you go find it on the internet in the worldly sense. So it's interesting that one of the characteristics is humility, and not everybody actually looks at that as a effective characteristic of leadership. And I would contend that it really is one of the more important characteristics of being a leader is to be humble. So check this out. In 2014, 2016, and 2018, those are the best leadership books of those various years. There are 60,000 plus books on leadership alone on Amazon right now. So clearly it's something that we seek after, right? And by the way, I'm a big fan of those. I read a lot. Uh, I've probably read probably half of those, but there's no replacement or substitute for what scripture has to say. Although I find a lot of commonality when I look through these leadership books, I think, wow, that reminds me a lot of the New Testament about how you're to take care of people and serve people and this and that. And I think, man, that looks like the fruit of the spirit. 
That looks like the Beatitudes. That looks like Colossians 3. But 60 plus thousand books today on Amazon alone on just the topic of leadership. We want it. Proverbs 2 says, for the Lord gives wisdom. It's from his mouth that knowledge and understanding comes. And yet we're always seeking in different places. In fact, I would contend that we're drowning in information. I mean, think about it. You're watching this digitally on a medium that didn't really exist 20 years ago. And yet we have at our disposal the most large, vast amount of information of any generation ever. And yet wouldn't you agree with me that we're kind of starving for wisdom? How do we use that data? King Solomon in 1 Kings 3.10 when when he responds back, he, this is what he asks of the Lord. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I might discern what is good and evil, for who is able to govern your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon said this. So of all the things that Solomon could ask for, he asked that he had an understanding mind. He had wisdom. Why? Because he was to govern people, God's people. Can you imagine if politicians of all stripes committed today that they would seek first God's wisdom because they want to make sure that they can discern good and evil so that they can govern well? That's what Solomon asked for. And even if you're not in government, if you're a leader in your family, in your church, at your work, wherever you find yourself, I pray that your prayer is this too. God, put it this a desire in my mind and my spirit that I may be humble so that I can understand how I can effectively do what it is that you've called me to do. Because we don't lack for information, do we? We lack for wisdom. So what is scripture there for? You know, we have the, the Holy Bible and I hope you're reading it. Second Timothy 3, 3, 16, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction and training in righteousness. Isn't that awesome? Like you may not know that scripture, or maybe you do. I actually have it memorized differently than that. So I had a hard time reading it. But 2 Timothy 3.16, I'm always reminded that I can pick up scripture and I can have confidence it was inspired, it was breathed out by God's spirit. And I can use it for my teaching to reproof me, meaning it's a type of correction. I'm kind of going off and I need to kind of hook me back into place for others. Correction. Sometimes we have to bring truth to people who may be behaving poorly or out of the will of God. And then also for general training in righteousness so that we can become more and more like our savior. So a second ago, I showed you this picture. I didn't even mention it to you, but the picture on the right, could you describe what it was going to look for? What will it look like when it's finished? Right. And I did that on purpose. I was just talking about wisdom, but you think you saw it. You thought, ah, what what that is we're seeking after something but what does it look like when i find it well the picture on the right is the other side of the tapestry and i'm always reminded that sometimes in the chaos of life when i can't make sense of heads or tails up or down north or south or whatever there's a there's a season of confusion or i'm nervous or i don't know what the lord is doing i have confidence because I've accepted his son as my savior. So I get this blessing. Only children of God get this blessing. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare, plans for your good, to take care of you, not for evil, to give you a future, to give you a hope. That's from Jeremiah 29, 11. Again, some of you may memorize that out of a different version. That's the English standard version. But the point is, the picture on the left is what we see on this side of eternity most of the time. The picture on the right is what we will see perfectly at some point. We will never become God, but we will have a better understanding of what it is that God was working out. Think about it in that right. If you just pause and think for a second, how many times that you can look backwards over your life at this point and realize, wow, the Lord really was stringing together something beautiful for me or for somebody else, even though it felt like anguish and pain or even in good times. We trust because he's proven himself over and over and over again. That's who holds our future. And the reason that this is in here with respect to leadership is never forget your service to people in the form of leadership is a privilege. It's an opportunity to to point them ultimately to how the father treats us. He treats us well. It's for our good, not for evil, 
Scripture goes on and says, Christ says this, in fact, how many of you who are evil would give their son a, a snake if he asked for a fish? Well, none of you would do that. And your father in heaven is enormously, tremendously better than you sinful people. That's what Christ said. I'm summarizing. Never forget that for his children, he makes a Bible full of promises to you. And I hope and pray that if you do not know the Lord as your personal savior, that this becomes something that you take seriously because there is a creator. The heavens declare his majesty every single day. If you had opened up your eyes, I opened up my eyes, I would see it because his presence is literally all around us. It is amazing to see the intricacies of everything from the micro level to the macro level. It's awesome. And for those that know me know that I love meteorology. And I want to run through this because what's interesting as it relates to being a leader, sometimes we have blind spots. Sometimes we don't even see what is there right in front of us. So on day two of creation, God made meteorology. As a meteorology fanatic, it always excites me, I think, because I think it's really cool that on day two of creation, God made meteorology basically as a science because that's when he separated water from water. So even though you don't know it, you're sitting in water right now right? Humidity. Uh, we feel it in the Alabama summer where it's 90 degrees, but 800% humidity, and it feels like 400 degrees outside. Obviously, I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea. We don't think about it that we're sitting in water. Right now, we're in water. It just has low humidity. Uh, so God, on day two, separated water from water. So water pools in the, you know, like in the oceans, up into the clouds, plus all of what we walk through and breathe in. But what the picture is, is actually a radar loop. Uh, my son and I and family, my daughter, uh, we all really kind of like meteorology and I've liked it since I was a child. And so we have this app that pulls up and it lets you see what the radar sees, right? So this was a storm about a year ago, actually, as a tropical storm was coming across in the Mobile. I found this picture. And uh, so there's a storm there coming up through, through Mobile. This is also a picture. Turns out this is the exact same time, exact same place. Do you know it? Did you notice anything missing? Look at that. So there's that picture. There's that picture. It's a little grainy, uh, but it's the same time, same place. I wonder what that is. What happened? So when you see these things side by side, I want to point out and remind us, Isaiah 55 is a great chapter, but Isaiah 55, 8 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. The reason I shared that with you this morning is that our perspective is faulty from the get-go, okay? We have to remember that. So what I showed you up on the screen is the same radar loop at the exact same time. The literally the only difference is the picture on the right is the radar that comes from Mississippi. The radar on the left is from Mobile. That dark spot is what they call the cone of silence. So we have these multi-million dollar pieces of equipment that tells us all sorts of fantastic things about the weather, about the atmosphere. But the one thing it cannot ever tell us is what's happening right outside. So for those of you that live here in Alabama, if you see them off beside the interstate, there's those really big, large white balls, those radar balls that you can see. There's one at the Shelby County Airport, in fact. Well, it has no idea what the weather is right outside itself. And I, that strikes me because I think, well, as humans, we think we are high-powered, very intelligent, and we are. We are made in God's image, so it's not surprising that we have intelligence. But sometimes I think our intelligence gets the better of us, and we forget that we start from a point of not being able to see. We can't see our blind spot. So I use this example because what comes next is what we need in our life. We need fellow believers to be able to help us see past our blind spots. You believe me? Do you have blind spots? And if you, do, if you don't admit that you have blind spots, then I would suggest that you, you might want to reconsider because we all have them. It is just the nature of a human condition. We can't see what oftentimes is closest to us. So we need a brother or a sister in Christ to encourage us, to use scripture, to reproof us, to correct us, to teach us, to encourage us, right? We need that. We can't do this alone. And so this is something that I feel like the Lord has really been working on me for a period of time is the concept of the forge. We're going to talk more about it in, on these Sunday school lessons, but the forge, Proverbs 27, 17 is a very popular scripture. Like one, many people know 
is iron sharpens iron, so one man or one person sharpens another. And and we love the, oh, you're right, that's right, iron sharpens iron. I wish I could put you in a blacksmith shop right now. Even if I showed you a video, it wouldn't be the same. You know, there's a picture. Here's another picture. Think about it for a second. Have you been in a blacksmith shop? Okay, well, if you have, you know you can smell sulfur. You can smell the, just all the smells of the metals as they're melting. The heat is tremendous because, as you imagine, it takes a lot of heat to get this metal to be what's called pliable. So the picture shows the anvil and the hammer hammering out what I'm going to show you here in a second for a purpose. I want you to look at this picture and then compare this scripture. Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I want you to remember this activity is violent. It's heat-filled. It's probably aggravating. It might be painful. But you know why we should do it? Because God has called us to something better. And oftentimes he is the one holding the hammer, by the way. He's the one who is refining us. He's the one putting us in there so that he can skim off the impurities off the top. So we're left with something pure. But just understand that it might be painful. Trust him and trust the process. Because at the end of it, you went through it for a purpose. The purpose is so that we can be used of the Lord. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So when we go through these challenges and we go through this, and sometimes we're called to help our brother or sister, where they're called to help us, we have to remember, take the advice, take the help when it is biblical to do so. It has to be biblical. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. But at the end of it, you have a, an instrument that is able to be used for its intended purpose. Have you ever run across those situations where you look at something and it's like, wow, that'd be great if it was used for its purpose, right? You ever, you ever come across that? Yeah, we do all the time in society. You think, wow, that, that wasn't even designed for that. Why are they trying to use it for that? Why are they trying to do this or what? Well, if I gave you that fine sword that's in this picture and you just hung it up on the wall or you tried to butter your bread with it, well, it was intended for either of those purposes. And eventually it would just rust and it would never have fulfilled that which it was called to do. So this is the fruit of the spirit that we covered last week. These are the fruits that are going to be in your life that are going to be bearing in your life that the the world is going to know that you're different and as you are leading no matter who you are you are a leader to somebody period we're, we're people of influence and we need to recognize that we have the ability to influence and lead other people they may be people in our family people at work people in the neighborhood people at church or unfortunately it could be the person that you cut off on the way to work in the morning yeah you influence them too in a negative way so we need to be careful about how we influence. But if we will set out to, to live these nine characteristics and show these nine fruits, because they're given to us, by the way, they're inside us. We just have to have the discipline to go through the effort because God's going to bring those things out in our life. And when he does, we can move from being cowardly to courageous. We can trust him more. We can impact the world more. I mean, just think about the impact that we could have if we would adhere to those, because we want this, whatever it is the Lord has called you to do or be, do it. Don't look back and you keep doing it. I was taught this as a child by my father. You keep doing what you know the Lord has called you to do until it's clear he's calling you to do something different. And I can attest to the fact that over all of these years, while it didn't make sense to begin with, I can promise you that has been a truth that I have kept and I have used and it is real in my life. Seek first the kingdom of God. Be an instrument in his hand for his purpose. Show the world these characteristics and live courageously. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for scripture that you have bound it up in a place that we can go and look. And in addition to praying to you first and seeking you first, we can read your words, your inspired words, that can get us, God, to become courageous and bold, not arrogant, but courageous and bold to be able to stand in the shifting sands of this world so that we can tell others about you. 
It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us.